have three bagels. Hey, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> we welcome you. We're thankful you're here with us today, and uh, we uh, uh, our our weather is changing yet again. So it's starting to spit some snow outside. Um, they fit again to the end of twenty three. So uh, it is New Year's Eve day today. So tomorrow is New Year's Day. A fresh beginning to a new year and, and new possibilities. So if you're watching online today, please say hi uh, so we know that you're with us this morning. This Wednesday, as I was just mentioning over here across the room, we're having a trivia and game night right here. And we'll be taking down some Christmas decorations and doing some trivia at the same time. Uh, we'll have bagels and all kinds of fun stuff here that night. Uh, so please join us for that. It should be a really, really good time. And then coming up this Saturday, we have another double header in place. Mm -hmm. We have our men's breakfast in the morning. I imagine there'll be some bagels there as well, uh, as well as biscuits. What, what is that again, Denny? Biscuits and sausage, right? Gravy? Oh, gravy, gravy, yes. Biscuits and gravy. And I thought he was going to say hash. Hash. <laughs> well, but we can do too. that. Um, so our next men's breakfast will be this coming Saturday, the 6th at 9 a.m., so we'd love to see you there. Uh, and then later that night, uh, we will be setting up for our movie, and that will be A Bridge to Terabithia. Uh, it's an awesome movie. Lori and I watched it again last night, so I could write my sermon on it for next Sunday. Uh, just so many things that it speaks to you about that you probably deal with in in your life at least once or twice in your life, if not on a regular basis. Um, adversity and, and things like that. Um, people not treating you right and how things come around. I, I love the part where they went to church in there and it was the first time that she had ever been to church and she kind of liked the Jesus thing. And I'm not gonna spoil the rest of the movie, so. Um, but please uh, come and check it out next Saturday night. The door is open at 5.30, movie at six o'clock. And I don't think we'll have bagels for that. I, I'm thinking we're going to do popcorn and maybe these little brown pucks. What are they called again? Mm, um, brownie, brownie bites. bites. Oh, yeah, brownie bites. And uh, we'll have hot dogs and, mm -hmm. and beverages and all kinds of fun stuff. And then coming up after that, we are going to be having season 19 of Orange Track Racing Begins. That will be February 10th right here. Uh, it's amazing to think that uh, coming up on 20 years, we're going to be pushing 20 years with this. So it's a very, very fun thing. Please invite uh, people with friends and, and uh, with little kids and things like that to come in and join it out. Uh, kids are welcome anywhere between, you know, 3 and 87 years old. So uh, bring them along along. And then coming up March 2nd, instead of having our men's breakfast that day, we will be traversing ourselves down to Davenport for the Iron Sharpens Iron. So our men's conference is going to be down at Davenport again, and that's a, a day-long event. Uh, last year we did uh, rent a 11-passenger van and took that down there, um, but make sure that if you want to go to let us know ahead of time in here. Um, Pre-registration starts, I believe, it's not on this one here. Pre-registration starts, I believe, in February. So uh, we'll be trying to get a group rate down there. We need to have at least 10 men in the group in order to get the discount rate. Um, but that is a, a very good, very, very good time. And uh, we had a very small crowd last year. Um, I think there was 1,150 men in the place packed in there. And so it was wonderful, and, and to hear us all singing in there is just incredible. Uh, and we actually hear it too. So <laughs> if you uh, would like to know more about that, uh, just check in with Pastor Terry and I. We're going to get, he's got an information packet in the back, and uh, we'll get you signed up. Uh, we'll have a sign-up sheet, I'm sure, here very shortly. Uh, today's worship music is going to be in a link that we're going to be posting up for you today. And so, that being said, 
Let's go to God and open this time of worship together. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this day, another day in your presence and another day of life. Lord, we thank you for the many and endless blessings that you give us each and every day. We just ask today that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, our hearts to accept the message that you are giving to us today in both word and in song. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us to live that message out and be a light to others so that we can shine a light in the midst of that darkness, in the midst of adversity in this world today, so that we could shine your light for others to see their way back to you. We praise you and thank you for these things and an opportunity to gather together today here uh, openly and just freely amongst ourselves. And we thank you for our church family and friends that are gathered as well. So we come to you today in honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Terry has chosen for our call to worship today, John 1.14. And this is a very, very uh, good passage because it talks about uh, what God and God put placing himself amongst us in the person of Jesus. So the word became human and made his home among us, and he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And in this passage in here, this verse is what's called a revelation. And so God is revealing his word to us. He's revealing his presence to us in Christ Jesus. The presence became human being and revealed the fullness of God, his identity to us in the flesh in Christ Jesus. The glory of God, as we go back all the way back into Exodus, and we go to Exodus 33, 22, it talks about the glory of God and what it is. And the glory of God became visible as grace and truth, which all the people need. And he is a greater revelation than Moses was back in the days of, of Exodus, in which uh, his law then revealed God's guidelines for our lives. And so his glory shone among us then in revealing his law on how to be a godly people. And that's what the whole Ten Commandments was about. It wasn't about how he wants to suppress us in our lives. He wants us to live a godly life through those laws that he gave Moses. He shows those guidelines can really be lived out in human form and flesh on the earth in the presence of Jesus. And so Jesus was the fulfillment of those Ten Commandments in person, in the flesh, and living amongst us. He is God in the flesh, letting us see what otherwise was impossible to see. Up to that point, no one had actually looked upon the face of Jesus, or looked upon the face of God. But here is Jesus living among us, God in his presence. We see the term glory here, and it's used again in this passion in this passage in here, and it's used to interpret glory as being something of great renown. So when we think of, of glory, we think of all these angels and harps and, you know, all kinds of fantastic things. But here, see, this glory is represented differently. It's re represented here. Glory is the weight or the importance of God. It is the light shining in which God confronts humans as his way of making that visible revelation of an invisible God. So that, when I was writing this yesterday, I, I, I was talking to Lori, and I just said, you know, this, this is how God comes amongst us. See, we, we, have, we take it upon faith because we can't lay our eyes upon God. So God made him visible to us so that we would understand that, yes, God is real. And so he became very real. It is the visible revelation of the invisible God. It is the radiant power of the creator appearing amongst his creation. And those things, I think, are very, very important. It is that which the human eye cannot see without facing death. And that goes back to Exodus again, 17 through 23. The radiance of God became visible to humans in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the representation, the representation of the glory of God. Jesus represents that glory of God to us, his very nature to us in his presence here on earth. Let us pray. 
Gracious Lord, as we come to the end of this year, uh, just simply a season or a time, we open our hearts to you today to speak to us in the message that you have Pastor Terry to share with us today. See, it's both a, an end and it's also a beginning. It's a way to shut down what happened to us last year and put behind us those things that may, may, may not have gone the way that we really wanted them to go. It's a time of closure. But at the same time, this is a time for a fresh start, a new beginning, a time for us to let go of the past, let go of the things that trap us, let go of the things that separate us from God and bring us back into his presence, bring us back into his glory, bring us back into that relationship that we need to have so that we can live the life that God planned for us to have before we were born. It's a time for us to recommit ourselves to God and to Jesus and to having that relationship. So as we listen to the message that Pastor Terry has for us this morning, let us open our hearts and our minds to hear and accept and to live out that message today. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. I like um, things to be symmetrical on that. So in order for this to match this side, this is the Bible trivia game. I was showing Mark the cover on it. It's an old console TV that had the little DVD player. I had to double check, make sure it wasn't VHS. We'll put there with it. It now feels better. Yeah, well, maybe not. There we go. Now they're. Oh my. What a beautiful day we have today. Even though it's kind of dreary out, we're coming to the end of 2023. Can you believe that? Where'd it go? Just ran away. Why is it the older that we get, the faster time seems to go? This past week has been one of endings. Is it four? Mark has lost four people that he knows, Mark and Roy have. We lost someone that we know. Three, actually. Diane's there. Diane's showing me this way. The most recent one was a former congregant, uh, Glenn Wallace. And I know we lost Dave King, and then you lost another one yesterday. And it's just these ends. But those ends are also a new beginning. For them, they're no longer in this world. They're in a new world. And this is why Jesus came. Now, I looked over here just a second ago out of the corner of my eye because I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to hit a candle. But those are gone already. Advent's over. Christmas no sooner has gone by and everything but doesn't it feel like everything just kicked right back into gear on Tuesday morning right the day after right Christmas day passes and life races on and I think too for, unfortunately too quickly we forget the reason for the season Advent had pointed us towards Jesus' birth Christmas, the day we celebrated his birth, is the day we celebrate our promised Savior. This John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But it's more than that. It's the day that we can celebrate eternal joy. That joy that comes through faith in Christ alone. Now, most of you, those of you that are on our uh, text chat, saw that I texted out on Friday that I got a text from my daughter that she was hiding in a doctor's office because of someone had a gun that went off. Now, fortunately, it was by accident, and all is clear. 
And all I could think of was, Satan, since I told you you can't bother me with all the ailments that you gave me, you're going after my family? I don't think so. The beauty of that day is that it ended and a new beginning came out of it. My daughter, I found out, was able to hide in that doctor's office with co-workers who were joined together in prayer. How awesome is it that she can go to work and be around like-minded people? The joy that came through faith in Christ alone. A former co-worker of mine, sorry Mark Van, this isn't anywhere in here. Um, her name is Carolyn, and Carolyn left where I worked several years ago. And At the time we had become Facebook friends, and I had not seen anything on Facebook from her for 10 years. Then all of a sudden, her cancer diagnosis popped up <laughs> in my feed. And she was so excited, she was full of hope because she was going to a specialist in Texas, and then they gave her even worse news about the cancer. Now, as a church, we are huge, big on prayer. And I thought about it last night as I was getting ready to fall asleep. I thought, I'll just send her a private message with a prayer in it. And God says, uh-uh. You put that out there for everyone. And I want you to pray for healing for her. And so I did. And I got a response back from her. She is growing in her faith. She is leaning on God. And I pray that God's mighty hand will heal her. but it's a joy that can only come through faith in Christ alone. Sounds like a Jeremy Camp song. Our passage this morning is going to come from John. It's the first part of John. It'll be John 1, 1 through 18. And it begins with what many have called a poem or a hymn that may have been sung by the earliest of Christians. Now, as you listen to these first five verses, listen for the themes that will prepare us for the rest of what John will write in this passage this morning. So let's start with John chapter 1. And this sounds an awful lot like the beginning. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. And nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Now, there's several themes in here. We're going to start out with the first one that says, The light came into the world. Now, John echoes Genesis chapter 1, where in verses 1 through 4, we see that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit already existed. This is different than the accounts that we read in Matthew and Luke, where they start with Jesus being conceived by the Holy Spirit. Instead, John takes us back even further. Now, with God, with the God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, there's no beginning. They are eternal. But this takes us back to our beginning, the beginning of this earth. If we think of uh, movie terminology, this is the prequel that John takes us back to when God created the world by speaking it into existence. This is very, very different than other ancient accounts of the creation of the world where the gods in those religions created a world out of something that already existed, oftentimes because of maybe a war between the gods. 
whereas God, our God, Elohim, the Supreme One, created everything, time, space, and matter out of nothing. This blows the whole evolution thing out of the water. Genesis 1, 1 through 4 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. This takes us to the second theme that says the light was rejected. Now some suggest that this happens between somewhere in between verses 1 and 2, and this is where Satan rebelled against God and was kicked out of heaven. Jesus will affirm Satan's fall from heaven in Luke 18. This happens after the 72 disciples had returned from their missionary trip. They joyfully reported that even the demons had obeyed them when using Jesus' name. It is then that Jesus tells them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And Satan's like that bully. He's not going to let things just be. Right? He, he's going to take God's creation with him. You think of the evil villains in the movies and the stories we read. I'm going to take somebody with me. Well, Satan decided he wanted to take the whole world with him. He thought he could, you know, bullies aren't very smart. He thought he was going to be able to take all of creation. It's in Genesis 3 that we learn more about his plan and ultimately the fall of humanity. Satan disguised as a serpent tempts Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He motivates her by telling her that she'll be like God. Last night we we've been <laughs> binge watching a show called 911. And last night the episode that we watched started off with this young boy on a bus and the heart the driver has a heart attack. And after the bus crashes into this gazebo and comes to a stop. He goes up front and gives the doctor, or the driver CPR, and saves him. And he is given all these accolades. Fast forward a couple decades, and he's a paramedic. He wants that rush. He wants that ability to feel what he felt as a child saving that man's life. So he had been injecting drugs into perfectly healthy patients that were getting ready to be transported to the hospital for checkup and then performing CPR or using the paddles to bring them back to life. In this story, at the end, when he, just before he's caught, he says, I am God. That's how I see Satan playing out. It's a wonderful theme of how Satan wants to play God. Now, our goal is to be Christ-like, right? It's our highest goal. But here's the difference. It's in how we do it. Satan enticed her into taking a shortcut. Now, we all know how shortcuts can turn out. I've heard horror stories from uh, husbands and wives who the husband always liked to take the shortcut. Oh, I'll just take this road here and we'll get there faster. And they end up lost. That's kind of what happened to Eve. She was taking a shortcut to being like God. And she ended up lost. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that Adam was standing right there. He's culpable too. He didn't stop her. And this, well, 
Pardon my language, but this is where all hell broke loose. Genesis 3, 6 and 7. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. I was a kid when I would read that passage, I would think, you know, wintertime, that'd be awfully cold. But as I matured in my faith, I realized that if we were still in the Garden of Eden, we wouldn't have to worry about any of that. But did you catch what Eve did there? She looked, she took, she ate, and she gave. Temptation starts with that first look. And then she acted upon it, which put her into sin. And then she spread that sin out. Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 10 that if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Nowhere in here, and people often get this wrong, nowhere in here does it say God will give you more than you can handle. Or won't give you more than you can handle. Because I can guarantee you, he is going to give you more than you can handle. And when those temptations come into play, he is going to show you a path out. It's because of Christ that we're no longer slaves to sin. We have the freedom, just like Eve did, to choose. Temptation happens to all of us. Not one of us is singled out. We have a friend of the ministry who has fallen to the temptations of the world. And we're praying for him. His situation has him out on the streets and doesn't have any shelter. And it's winter time. I am in agreement with the prayer that Denise put out there for him and the scripture that she shared with us that he would turn his eyes back to God. See, others have resisted temptation and so can we. We're able to resist that temptation because God will show us a way out. The thing is, is that Satan tries to make Staying in that sin seemed easier than the way out. And sometimes that way out is going to require work. It's going to be difficult. But we have to do it. God shows us through the scriptures who and what to look out for. We don't want to be like Jonah and run from God. Rather, we want to run from the temptation to God. We need to seek out other believers who can help us. James teaches us that when our faith is tested, it is an opportunity to strengthen us and give us the endurance we need to be Jesus' light in the world. Just like Adam and Eve, Satan has blinded so many people from seeing the glory of Jesus Christ. That's why God sent Jesus, the light of the world, into the world. And although Jesus was constantly rejected, the darkness of this world could not and never will extinguish his light. It was by Jesus' death on the cross that the gift of light, or the gift of light, is given to all believers. This is our third theme. We are given this gift. In Matthew, we hear, we wouldn't t take a lamp and cover it with a basket and hide it. You've heard Mark and I say this many times. 
if you've got the cure for an incurable disease or what previously was an incurable disease, you're not going to keep it to yourself. The sad part is, is in this world, somebody may have created it and kept it to themselves because they are of this world. We need to share that light with others. John 1, 6 and 9 says, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. John was the first to bear witness to Jesus, to bear witness to this light. But he's not the last. And neither are we. We all have this same responsibility. We, like John, are not the source of the light, we are a reflection of that light. Is that how people see you? As a reflection of Jesus, the true light of the world. It is by his light that we can see our way to God. And we help light that path to God. We don't ultimately <coughs> convert anyone. We light the path. God does the rest. This is the foundation of why we here exist as a church, as Grace Street Church. We're passionate about pointing people to and helping them to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The moment you go out to our website, that's the first thing you can read on it after the pop-up's clear. Sin blinds people from knowing their creator. John 1, 10, 11 says, He came into the world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. Even the Jews, God's own people, who have been waiting for the Messiah, didn't recognize him. Now, for us, we can sit here and look back, and say, how could they miss the signs but hindsight's 2020, 20, right? I can look back at all the things I did in my life and go, hmm, well, maybe I should have done this, I should have done that, I should have recognized this, I should have recognized that. We can't judge the Israelites because we do the same thing. But it's hard when we know the scriptures to not to go, guys. These were God's chosen people. They were there. God created them. God selected them to prepare the rest of the world for the coming of the Messiah. And they didn't do a very good job. Now, over the last four weeks, we have looked in detail at the people and the events that surrounded the Christmas story in the Why the Nativity series. For you that are online, if you're watching for the first time, Go on to our Facebook page. Go to our website. Go, click on Messages. You can watch that whole series. We took a look at why Jesus became a man. We took a look at why God chose Mary and Joseph. And last week, we looked at why we call him Savior. Each of them had a specific purpose. And throughout it all, we could see that Jesus was born to die. Jesus came to earth to defeat death and make all those, thank, all those who accepted him as Lord and Savior righteous in God's eyes. Verses 12 and 13 say, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. This is not something that we just receive and let it sit. And as I was thinking about things that we receive and let them sit, first thing that came to mind was, well, the mail, as you 
get the mail and take it out of the mailbox to set it on the counter and oftentimes you'll walk away and come back to it later especially if there's bills <laughs> but the first the only thing i do first with any of it is take the junk and get rid of it but then i thought man i look at it a little bit quicker what about email yeah. whose email inbox looks horrible nobody else has to respond mine looks absolutely awful See, we have to take and act on it. In James, we're taught that faith without action isn't. Action is showing our faith. When we accept him and allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us, we change. We are supernaturally reborn and given a new life, a life that stretches not to the end of our existence here on earth, but into eternity. All of this is made possible through Christ's birth. Let's look at these last five verses, 14 through 18. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him. When he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another, for the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Before Christ came, the people could only know God partially. After, well, you've heard the expression, this changes everything. Yeah, that. When Jesus came, it changed everything. And after Christ came, the people could know him completely because Jesus was there in their midst. He was fully human. He was visible. And the things he said and did were observable. Remember doubting Thomas? I won't believe it until I see him, until I put my finger into the hole in his side, right? Jesus just shows up and he says, Blessed are those who have seen and believe, but even more blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Jesus was God and he was man. One of the mistakes that we make is to minimize this. We either minimize his humanity or we minimize his divination, his divinity. That is not to say that he is half God and half man, but he is one person, fully God and fully human. For Jesus to be fully human, he was given life by the Holy Spirit through his mother Mary. Because he is fully God, Jesus gave life back to his mother. Because he was fully human, he had to rest and to sleep. Because he is fully God, he was able to raise the dead to life. He came to become a man to experience all that we do. He experienced hunger, pain, temptation, Grief, hardship, rejection, suffering, and on and on. And he did it all without sinning. Jesus is the perfect high priest who is able to sympathize with us in our own weakness and our own suffering. The writer of Hebrews puts it well in chapter 11, verses 14 and 16 when they write, So then... Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it. 
Jesus turned to the scriptures and he used them against Satan's temptation. After he's baptized by John, he goes into the desert and Satan tempts him. Over and over he is tempted. And what did Jesus do? Well, he knew the word. And because he knew the word, he knew the Father. And because he knew the Father, he could take and say, no, you don't do that. No, don't do that. When we are tempted, we need to go to God in prayer. We need to communicate with our Father. Let me preface this by saying that in every way the temptation to sin to go against God's will is bad. But I'm a cup half full. I never used to be, but I am now. I'm a cup half full kind of guy. And what if we took and looked at temptation rather as a invitation to Satan's world, but we used it as an invitation to get closer to God. And in doing so, we receive his mercy and his grace. Mercy in that we do not get what we deserve, and grace in getting what we don't deserve. The law couldn't get us there. We can't follow rules. We're terrible at that. Anymore, I think stop signs are a suggestion and not the law. But it shows us our sin. Paul wrote that. He said, the law showed me my sin. But, so we could make right, be made righteous and acceptable to God, Jesus had to live a life of a complete obedience to that law. And he did. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Don't understand why I have come. Or don't misunderstand. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. He did not erase them. He came to accomplish their purpose. We are given God's unfailing love and faithfulness because of Christ. We have been given a gift that no one else can give. One that no one else can bring. And as we continue to grow in Christ, we get to know Jesus better and better. And in getting to know Jesus better, we get to know the Father, and our understanding of the Father grows. Jesus said, no one can come to the Father except through me. He also said, if you know me, you know the Father. God is perfectly revealed in Jesus. To know Jesus is to know God. Genesis tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Christmas story is a new beginning. One that teaches of God's grace, mercy, love, and forgiveness. I just finished my reading plan for the year this morning before when I got up. Cup of coffee in hand, sitting in the dark, reading. And, of course, final chapter of Revelation. In the end... See, the end of the Bible is the end of the Bible, but it's also a new beginning. God's servants will offer God service by worshiping him. They'll look at his face, and their faces will reflect or mirror God. Our response to seeing God's face is eternal worship. The book of Psalms ends with hallelujah, which translates to praise the Lord. Psalm 150 itself begins and ends 
for the hallelujah. In this version, it says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that God breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So what should we do? We need to worship everywhere. We need to worship him for everything. We need to worship him in every way. It's my pr prayer that as this new year begins tomorrow, that each of us makes it our resolution to know God more. Lord, we praise you for your unsurpassing greatness and your mighty acts of power. We worship you as the creator of the entire universe, yet you love each and every one of us personally. Father, thank you that one day we will drink the water of life to our heart's content. Thank you that we will see you face to face and we will reign with you forever and ever. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you that in the new heaven and the new earth, we will enjoy your great love forever and ever. Thank you that right now we can know your love through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we experience your love poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we will praise your name forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare our time now for a time of communion, a gathering together with God, I want you to think about what, what Pastor Terry talked about in the message today, that this is a time of preparedness, a time for us to regather ourselves together with God. And he sent his son Jesus to be able to do that. He, he sent Jesus as the conduit to bring us back to God, to give us that life eternal through him. And in, in doing so, he sent his son to die on the cross, being fully God and yet being fully human, taking on the sins of us, our sins, in his humanness, and then handing them over to God for reconciliation, for atonement, once and for all. So as we come into this time of communion today, I want you to think about that. I want you to be in remembrance of that moment when Christ was fully human and took on our sins, was fully God and, and paid that atonement for those sins to give us that right relationship with God and to bring us into a relationship into eternity, which can no, be, cannot be done any other way except through Christ Jesus. So on the night that he was given up, as he was eating with the disciples, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. It was a representation of him breaking down his body, his sin, giving his life for them. Later in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it and he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And through his blood, we are washed clean of those sins body and the blood of Christ. Lord, we thank you today that we have this opportunity to gather together to share in that gift, to share in that meal of the body, of the bread, and of the juice, to bring a remembrance into us today of your sacrifice for us, your atonement for our sins, the body of Christ broken for you. blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. 
as we come into this time, our prayers for people, we've had a lot of loss this year, and so I, I want to lift up those who are grieving in those periods of loss. Uh, as Pastor Terry said, there is a lot in the last uh, the last week here. Uh, some lifelong friend of mine passed away, and I spent a long time yesterday just thinking about that, and, and I was praising because he was a godly person. Throughout his life, he was a godly person. And so I have that assurance, that blessed assurance, that he is with Jesus today. Do we have other prayers we need to lift up this morning? Yes. Um, Lisa, who was the uh, secretary at HUS. Yes. Her niece, Ellen, has uh, diabetes bad. Okay. And she wasn't paying attention, and because of that, she got a cut on her foot. Her foot became infected. Mm -hmm. It's gone into sepsis, and she may lose her foot. She is 36, 37, so very young to be dealing with that. So Lisa's and niece. Lisa's niece, Ellen. 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 Any others that we'd like to lift up today? Becky's mom. Becky's mother. Okay. Anybody else? Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you for this gathering together today. That you are in our presence here with us today. In our worshiping of you. In our hearing of your word. And in your being here with us and amongst us as we go through each and every day of our lives. Lord, we have special prayers that we want to lift up to you for those who are grieving. We lift them up to you for those who have had loss in their family. We lift them up to you as well. We ask that you would surround them with your care and comfort, that they could persevere through this loss and through this grief, that you would give them comfort you would give them love. You would show them your grace and mercy. And through that, through that, they would understand that, yes, you are a true, faithful, and a loving God. We lift up Ellen, and we pray, Lord, that you would do a mighty work. We come against that infection in your precious and holy name. We ask that a mighty healing would be done in her and that she would be healed. Lord, we ask for travel mercies for those who are traveling and couldn't be with us here today, for those who are still recovering from surgeries and from illnesses, and uh, they couldn't be with us here in our presence here today. We lift them up to you as well. For those who are preparing to go and, and have procedures done, Lord, we ask that you would be a guide to the caregivers a guide to the surgeons, a guide to those who would give those treatments to them through the training that you have provided in their lives. Lord, we lift all these things up to you today. We lift up all of the hurt in the world, all of the wrong that is being done in the name of territorial lines or political affiliations. Lord, we just lift that all up to you today. We know that you have enough love to surround this entire world. We ask for a healing in this world. We ask for a common sense to come back into the people in this world. And to understand that you can't cancel people out because they don't agree with you. Lord, we just ask for a healing touch to be upon this world. We ask for us, as we go back into the world today, for us to remember you, to remember your grace, remember your mercy, remember your love, but moreover, to act upon it and to shine that love, that grace, that mercy into a hurting world that needs your word, needs your love, needs your grace, and needs your mercy more than ever. We thank you, Lord, that you are a faithful God, that you will answer these prayers if they come through with a fervent and an earnest heart to Father God, we lift all these precious things up to you today 
in the name of your one and only Son, Jesus. And all God's people said, As pastors, we're horrible not asking for prayer for ourselves. So I would ask that we would also include Mark as a week from Tuesday. Thursday. Thursday. The 11th. He'll be having surgery and starting with me. And it's awfully cold out to be having that surgery, too. So we will be praying for you as you have that surgery. At the beginning of the year, Mark challenged us to pray this prayer throughout Lent. So how fitting is it on the last day of this year, we close out the year with this same prayer. Before I do that, though, I just have one thing to say. Satan, get out of our house. Get out of our families, get out of our friends, get out of our lives. We, ha You have no business here. You have no claim to us. Lord God in heaven, I pray for you to move against the forces of evil. Lord God, I ask that by your mighty power that you would bind Satan and all of his minions from every aspect of our lives, as well as those of our family and our church family. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, bind all the forces of darkness and disband them with your light. Throw the enemy forces into confusion, hampering their plans and shutting down their schemes so that they will not prosper in their rebellion against you and we, your people. We pray that any and all support of those who do evil in your sight would be dissolved. We pray that their hard hearts would be softened, that they would turn to you, Father God that they would be made right in your sight through the salvation that comes through accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, let us have eyes to see past the deception of the enemy, and instead of rebellion, that there would be repentance. Draw us ever closer to you, Father. Open our eyes to see that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the commander of heaven's armies, the Most High God. Lord, send your warring angels to protect and surround us from all evil. It is our prayer that all the forces of evil that are working against the efforts of Grace Street Church, our church family, our family and our friends would be bound away and that they would become powerless because of the mighty power Lord Jesus, we claim this as a victory in your name. And we know that by calling on your name that you will protect us. All glory, honor, and praise to you forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week. For those of you online, we hope you can join us again next week, and we would love to see you in person. Go with me.